Well, I've never really been a big fan of reality TV. I just don't find it interesting whatsoever. Can't say I've ever really watched an episode of anything, to be honest. But I do find the concept quite intriguing. Why would people choose to do this? To go on TV and make fools of themselves in such a way just to gain fame or make money? Well, this story takes the notion into a strange, weird and deadly place. Now, sit back and relax with your favourite drink, my dear, dear friends. It's time to listen. It was a friend of mine who would introduce me to the show. He'd seen my attempt to stay up for 100 hours on YouTube, a video of mine that had seen moderate success considering the size of my channel, and had sent me a link to sign up online with the message... This seems like something you'd like. At that point, my life changed. Now, I'm lying in a hospital, with some of the very same people in this story in the adjacent beds. I've decided to document what happened to us, and they've helped me to fill in any blanks from the bits when I wasn't around. So, this is it. My friend had been right. The website displayed a grand villa in the southwest countryside, complete with an infinity pool that looked to spill directly into some unknown bay a short walk down from the house. A huge living area contained two large white corner sofas that looked in at each other, and several dark oak coffee tables spotted the space between them. A wall of glass looked out onto the pool, the bay, and beyond. The lounge area was joined to an open-plan kitchen, and then stairs led up to bedrooms and bathrooms and a door marked with a picture of a tent. The house was the destination for a new show, Forty Winks. The premise was fairly simple. Eight participants all enter the villa to compete for a cash prize of £5,000. The winner was to be either the last person left awake, or, assuming there were at least two participants remaining, the cash would be split between whoever was left after seven days. The cash was only a small incentive for me. If the show did well, I'd hoped it could help propel my popularity and help me to get some sort of semi-celebrity status. I thanked my friend and filled out the form on the website to apply for the show. But, well, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. They got back to me within the hour and I was given the upcoming Thursday as a date for an interview. I tried my best to research the company behind the show, Ahisma, but my attempts were fruitless. In the end, I figured they were a startup, and this show would be their first. Based on the prize fund, they had to be pretty limited budget-wise. they probably just rent the house for the week. My interview went by with no problems. I was witty, funny, and, well, I'm pretty good looking. Although neither of us could deny the most important factor, I had a viewer base that would transfer over to them if I participated. I signed the forms without bothering to read them. The guy interviewing me gave me the brief of the document anyway. There will be eight participants, he said. Four guys and four girls, all about the same age as you. I nodded passively, hiding my eagerness to share a week in a luxury villa with the girls. Beyond this form, I have to tell you, there are five main rules. He pulled the documents I'd signed back over to his side of the desk and flipped back a couple of pages. Then he grabbed a recorder from his pocket, clicked it on and sat it on the table. He prefaced his speech with, Liam Williams. Recording of terms and conditions, and then began. Firstly, you must always wear the microphones. They are waterproof, so do not remove them in any instance. Secondly, you will be watched and listened to at all times. Cameras are installed in every room except for the bathrooms. Anything you say or do will be recorded and may be televised. Thirdly, physical violence is unacceptable in any circumstance. 
Fourthly, you will each be given an individual safe word for use only if you want to leave the show. Before using your safe word, we recommend coming to the den, where doctors and psychiatrists will be able to help. And lastly, do not leave the premises. If any of these rules are broken, you will be immediately removed from the show, and you will not receive any form of payment. Do you understand all of these terms? I understand, I complied. Great, he smiled, turning off the recorder. If you're happy to proceed, the show begins a month tomorrow. We will be in contact regarding all necessary correspondence. It was a pleasure to meet you. He smiled and extended his hand, and we said our goodbyes. I was buzzing with excitement. Ironically, I didn't sleep particularly well for that entire month, as every day brought me closer to what I had convinced myself would be an incredible week. Other than clothes and prescription drugs... We were each allowed to bring one item with us, with no strings attached. I opted for a 24-pack of Red Bull, but I was only allowed to take ten of them in. I figured one every ten hours would get me four days in, no problem. Day one. Stock count, ten Red Bull. They staggered our arrival into the villa so that we could each be greeted one at a time. Our bags had already been assigned to and placed into our rooms. I was the second to enter the villa and met Jessie, a sweet little fireball with hair that twisted over her left shoulder. Her hands were little fists hidden in the sleeves of an oversized grey jumper when I entered, and she leaned onto tiptoes when we shared a hug and said hello. I'd barely had any time to learn that she was a student studying marine biology when the door opened again. This was Lucy. She was tall, blonde, and reasonably good-looking, despite being gangly and somewhat awkward. She was nice, though, and it was her idea to open the welcome champagne left on one of the oak tables. Lucy was the party girl. From that point on, whenever someone would enter, we would all raise our glasses and cheer before making our introductions. Curtis was a muscled-up, chiseled jawline without a personality. But Lucy blushed and cooed over him anyway. Annie and Adam came in together as a couple, and that just left Jules and Oscar, two nice enough characters who were just here to have a good time, and maybe leave £5,000 richer. A tablet was our only source of communication with the people running the show. It had been all but ignored so far, sitting on one of the oak tables with eight small wooden boxes surrounding it. After a few minutes of us all being in the lounge, it buzzed for our attention. Curtis nominated himself without consultation, picked up the tablet and read aloud. Welcome, everyone, to the Villa of No Sleep, he read from the screen. We all cheered. Now that you're starting, and we're getting settled in, it's time you all got to know each other a little better. Inside these boxes are notes that represent each of your special items. In the order we give you, you will each take it in turns to pick a box. You can then choose to either stick with the item in that box, or pick a different one, and keep that item. You can only change boxes once, and you're not allowed to trade your items. Jesse, it's your turn first. We all sat down and huddled around the coffee table, filled with nervous anticipation. Jessie picked up the box nearest to her. She pulled out a folded piece of paper from the box. Curtis's box, she said, and then puffed as a little laugh escaped her lips. Jessie looked at him as she read. <laughs> Twelve ripped condoms. We erupted in laughter, and Curtis went bright red, although I think we all knew he loved the attention. This is who he was. Oof, definitely a switch, Jessie laughed, putting the box back down. She picked up another, which contained my Red Bull. I sucked air through my teeth. Oh, fair enough, I said, somewhat disappointed. It was Oscar to choose next. He'd been pretty quiet so far, and was equally as dull with the boxes. 
picking out his own box first time, which was a book he was currently reading. By the end, none of us except for Oscar had our own items. Annie had the condoms. I had Adam's glucose tablets. Curtis had Annie's cards. Adam had Lucy's rum, and, well, you get the idea. We spent all night occupying ourselves with simply getting to know each other. Adam and Annie snuck upstairs at one point, but other than that, it was pretty uneventful. By about 5am, Jesse and I were by the edge of the pool, looking out between the trees and into the sea, waiting for the sun to rise. I wouldn't worry about it too much, I was saying. They're not going to let it get too much out of hand. Kind of scares me too, but if you do feel like something really bad is going to happen, you can always just, well, sleep, you know? Yeah, I guess you're right, she agreed. She pushed off from one edge of the pool and stared up at the sky. I guess we'll just have to enjoy ourselves before we all get too messed up, she said indifferently. I am right, I said, turning to face her. I remember how she looked so angelic, basking in the yellow light spilling through the glass wall behind her. Day 2. Stop count, 14 glucose tablets. When it got to 8 in the morning, and the sun was officially up, I took a glucose tablet with some cornflakes for my breakfast. All of the tea and coffee was decaffeinated. Adam had promised us we'd get through tonight together by getting through the rum, and we'd all agreed that it was a fantastic idea. I felt fine, a little tired, but the first 21 hours had flown by, and I was feeling relatively perky. Oscar had spent a majority of the night on the sofa, reading his book. Unfortunately for him, I could see he was going to be finished any time soon, and he might actually then have to join us. At about midday, Jesse ran up to me, bursting with excitement. She grabbed my hand and led me upstairs, to the room with a picture of a tent on the door. The den. We went inside and she locked the door behind us, and then proceeded to sit in the chair in front of the camera and tap on the armrest for me to join her. I obeyed. Hello, Jesse. Hello, Liam, said a female voice. I choose Liam, Jesse announced. You choose me, I asked, pointing to myself. Liam, the voice started, retaking my attention. Jesse has been set a secret task by the den, to choose a partner in crime. Together, you must both come up with a plan to rile up a fellow housemate, and then pin the event on someone else. Liam, do you feel up to the challenge? I laughed, mischievously. <laughs> yes, I said. You must come up with the ruse by yourselves. What you do is up to you. Goodbye. We left the den and giggled all the way down the stairs. We schemed in the pool. The idea came to me easily. We were going to hide Oscar's book. Once it was evening, Jessie would tell him she'd seen Curtis with it earlier that day. Then we'd sneakily place it under the sofa. But we'd already have torn out the back pages. It was evil, and we loved it. We spent the whole day eyeing up the book Oscar was so close to. Meanwhile, Annie, Adam, Curtis and Lucy had been spending the day flipping between playing Would You Rather and playing cards. We finally grasped at the opportunity to hide the book when Oscar went up to the den. This is when it all started to go so very, very wrong. Oh, I'm feeling a bit tired from this. I'll update you with everything else that happened very soon. God, I almost never want to repeat what happened in that villa. So, here's a quick reminder from what I wrote previously. We're in a villa where the aim is to stay awake the longest for a cash prize. All of our special items have been mixed around. Myself and Jesse are pretty friendly, and we've just stolen Oscar's book. 
When Oscar came back down from the den, he almost immediately flipped out. Where is it? He screamed. Myself and Jesse ran in from different directions and pulled our best, most innocent and confused faces. She was on her way back from hiding it under her bed. What's up? Curtis came in with a bag of crisps, laughing at an out-of-character Oscar. Don't what's up me, Oscar spat. It's my book. My book's gone. He started feverishly ripping the cushions from the sofas and throwing them across the room. He was utterly overreacting. Curtis just stood by, laughing, popping the occasional crisp into his mouth. Jesse and I shared a look but we weren't sure what the consequences would be for failing our task. And besides, I was trying to make good TV, and, well, this was it. Annie, Adam, Lucy and Jules each made their way into the lounge towards the commotion. Just as Jules arrived, the tablet buzzed for our attention once again. I grabbed the tablet from a pile of plastic flutes, cushions and other debris off the floor. By now, you're all starting to feel the side effects from not sleeping. But remember, you're only on hour 28. As I started reading, Oscar gave up his search and sat on one of the cushionless sofas, head in his hands. Oscar, as you may have noticed, your book has been taken by one of your fellow housemates. A couple of the others laughed at this, but Jesse and I were deadpan. Oscar was looking up at me from the sofa, not moving. You have five minutes with each house member to interview them about the theft of your property. You must come back with a single name. If this person was involved, you will receive your book, along with a reward. If they were not, you will not receive your book back for the duration of your stay. You can interview in any order you would like. Other housemates? You may not talk about the situation. Good luck. I placed the tablet onto one of the tables and looked around. None of us spoke for a long second. Curtis, Oscar said, shaking his finger in his direction. Let's go. We all helped to put the place back together, and it was decided, without discussion, that one of the benches outside would be the interview zone. Curtis has since told me, and we all agree, that Oscar thought it was him that had taken the book. Curtis would answer a question, and then Oscar would laugh or shrug his shoulders. He walked back inside, shaking his head. Oh, the guy's gone nuts, he said. Jesse, you're up next. Jesse locked eyes with me again as she walked to the door, then took a deep breath and went outside. It was a long five minutes, but Jessie came in and gave me a little smile. Liam, it's you now, she said. Oscar didn't bother to turn around as I went outside, and I found him squinting against the sun at something in the distance. It was blazing, and shadows were painted directly beneath the bench. Take a seat, he said, still not meeting my eyes. I was starting to wonder if he already knew. Jesse and you are getting close, huh? He asked. Is this part of the interview? I quipped. He sighed. No, not really, he admitted. You were in the lounge when I left and then outside when I came back. So what were you doing in the time when the book went missing? He asked. I thought about it for a second and hummed. <laughs> Honestly... I just went to the pool for a bit. At this point, I remember seeing him try to suppress a grin. Anything else? He asked. I thought about lying, but then decided to give him as little information as I could. No. What about Jessie? What was she doing? I hesitated again. Uh, she just went to her room. Not sure why. He asked me a few more questions. Where was Curtis or Adam? What might the incentive have been? And then sent me in to get Adam and Annie. I sat down next to Jessie, and she looked at me inquisitively. How'd it go? 
she asked. Fine, I think, I said. Curtis is right, though. He does seem... off. She nodded in agreement. Did he ask you where I was? She asked. Uh, yeah. I said you went upstairs. There was a brief pause, and then it hit me. My stomach flipped. I didn't know why I was so scared. Jessie didn't know where I'd been, so she could only have assumed. My voice was nearly a whisper. What did you say about me? I asked, eyes wide. We were staring at each other. Well, she stammered, I said you were getting food. I said I was in the pool. I managed. Jessie's eyes had locked off from mine, and she was staring behind me. I turned my head. From outside on the bench, Oscar twisted around from his perch and stared right at us. I took Jessie's hand and led her upstairs to her room. I had a plan. Bring about peace by giving him back the book. Yeah, you know, make up in that way that guys do. Uh, okay, it was me, I'd say. I was set a task by the show. Here's the book. Good job, well done. Jessie handed me the book without much of a protest to the idea. But when I took it from her, I could feel something beneath the back page. I opened the last page and there, taped to the inside of the cover, was a small, clear pouch of solid, white pressed pills. What? was all Jessie managed to say. Without a second thought, I unstuck the bag and inspected the twelve or so pills. I popped them in my pocket and we went downstairs. I hid the book under one of the sofa cushions. The plan to hand it back had been abandoned. We were going to try and get away with it. Before that, though, I needed to find out what the pills were. Except for Adam and Oscar, out having an interview, everyone was still sat in the lounge. I sat facing away from the glass wall and asked for no one to react to what I was saying. We found these pills in his book, I said, discreetly sliding them out of my pocket. Curtis jumped back in his chair with his hands over his mouth. <laughs> he wasn't very good at not reacting. Oh, no wonder he's so angry. He took so much pride from our discovery, we all laughed a bit with him. You think he's got these to stay awake? He asked. I made a sound, almost like a laugh. <laughs> Either that, or he's got them to get us all to sleep. I pondered. We all considered for a second. Then Annie spoke up. I don't reckon so. How about this? Curtis started. We'll all each take two and keep them in our pockets. I looked at the bag. That was just about enough. If he says they're for keeping him awake, we all take the things. If he says they're for sleeping, then he's caught. We couldn't argue with that logic. It was early afternoon by the time Oscar was done with his interviews. He looked worse for wear. Bags were appearing under everyone's eyes, but his were darker. His hair was a mess, and slight sunburn only intensified his features. The tablet buzzed, and Annie picked it up. Oscar, you've interviewed all of your housemates. Who is your nomination? He paused for a second and looked around the room. I thought it was Curtis, but... He pointed at me and Jesse and back again. You two are messed up, he said, smiling. I think it was Liam. Everyone turned and looked at me. A smile crept onto my face. It was getting harder to remember that this was just a show. I had to be happy for the cameras. <sighs> yeah, I sighed, feigning annoyance. You got me. But for Oscar, everyone cheered. And for a second, we were back to normality. I took the book out from under my sofa cushion and passed it over to him. Things changed immediately. No, he screamed launching the book across the room. A couple of the girls jumped back into their seats. Adam was suddenly on his feet. 
Where are they? Oscar yelled. His face was pure anger. His temper was getting to me, but I pretended I didn't know what he was talking about. He marched over to me and I jumped to my feet. I was slightly taller than him, and adrenaline was taking over. <laughs> I knew I could take him. What are you going to do? I chided. Go on, do it. Give them back, he ordered. Or what? was the best response I had at the time. Curtis had a hand on each of us, ready to pounce if either of us went for the other. The tablet buzzed. Only Jessie noticed. She picked it up and started reading to herself. Where are the pills? Oscar demanded. We swallowed them. I lied. All of us. We took two each. Oscar's face began to buzz, his eyes darting from one of my eyes to the other. His breathing was so heavy. Then he screamed at me, turned around and went outside to his perch. <laughs> well, I guess they're for staying awake, I said to the group, victorious. I took my two pills out from my pocket and swallowed them both. Except for Annie and Adam, everyone else quietly did the same. Jules went out to comfort Oscar. He'd thrown a tantrum, but he hadn't been a bad guy. And, to be fair, we'd screwed him out of his pills. In the excitement of mine and Oscar's confrontation, Jessie had forgotten to read out the tablet's message. Suddenly remembering, her face paled. She picked it up again and read it to us quietly. Well done, Oscar, she half whispered. You may now reclaim your book. On top of this, for the next 24 hours... You're granted overarching powers in the villa. You are free to take any of your fellow housemates' special items as you please. Your fellow housemates must listen to you at all times. Failure to do so will result in eviction from the house. You must not put your fellow housemates in danger or ask them to do anything that is beyond socially acceptable. You are now the only person that is allowed to speak with us in the den. We all sat in stunned silence for a couple of moments. The tablet buzzed again. Jessie read the new message. Housemates, by taking Oscar's pills, you have taken part in foul play against one of your fellow housemates. All of you, except for Oscar, are now confined to your rooms for the next three hours. One final buzz. All housemates must be made aware of Oscar's current position in the house. Jessie sighed. I'll tell him. She went outside, and then all of us lumbered up to our rooms. I was sharing with Adam, but, of course, we weren't ever really planning on spending much time in our rooms. We spoke for a little while, but our conversation was dull, and neither of us were trying to sustain it. My mind began to drift off. All I can remember seeing were these flashes in my mind. Tiny dreams that happened despite the fact I was trying so hard to stay awake. In one of these dreams, I was stabbing myself repeatedly in the chest through my shirt. The pain was immense. Blood was seeping through my cotton. Then I came back around, my hands grasped firmly onto the white bedding. Adam! I asked. Yeah, he murmured, daydreaming. I didn't follow up my question. I couldn't, because my vision was so focused on a tiny fleck in the wall. It was like I was falling into it. It got larger and larger, until it was this huge hole in front of me. It began to scream. It was unending. A scream that echoed out and around me. It got louder and louder and louder. It shook my bones. When I came around a couple of moments later, my eyes were squeezed as tightly shut as I could get them. My palms were crushing my ears. I was screaming. I came out of it like a child calming down. The scream began to fade off, and then... My hands were finally allowed to come away from my ears, and I opened my eyes. 
Adam's voice faded in. Liam, Liam, speak to me. Are you okay? He was shaking my leg. I needed to vomit. I'm okay, I said, pushing him off me. I needed my safe word, but couldn't for the life of me remember what it was. The room was spinning. I reached for the door handle and missed. I got it on the second attempt and stumbled out of the room. Jules was on her knees in the middle of the doorframe to her room. Her eyes were entirely dilated. Her face was as white as a sheet. God, did I look like that? I took fumbling steps towards the bathroom door. The bile was rising in my throat. I leaned into it and haphazardly swung the door open. Jessie was in the bath, underwater and not moving a muscle. Her hair was like a veil that floated above her face. Her clothes were torn. Jessie! I yelled in horror. I ran over to the bath and fell to my knees. I lifted her head out of the water and put my ear against her mouth. She was utterly lifeless. From behind me, I just managed to identify footsteps. I shook Jessie, calling out to her. Oscar came up and squatted next to me. Looking into the bath, he turned to me and whispered in my ear. Those pills weren't to keep me awake, and they weren't to put you to sleep. They're hallucinogens, and you were supposed to take them. When we left off, I had just found Jesse in the bath. Oscar had told me that I was supposed to have taken the pills all along. I looked at Oscar in sheer horror. He casually stood up, turned on his heels and walked out of the room. My vision was spinning in such a way that it truly felt like gravity was changing the direction of its pull. I clicked back into reality to find my head falling toward my shoulder. As I snapped it back upright in a glimpse of sobriety, the world spun back into place. I looked back to the bath, and it was empty. No water, no Jessie. No heavy head in my arms, no ripped clothes. The shock of her being gone was almost as jarring as the shock of her being there in the first place. It had felt so real. It took massive amounts of effort, but I heaved myself back to my feet. I didn't know what I was trying to do at the time, but I knew that I had to do something. When I came to the top of the stairs, I had no choice but to get onto my knees and lean against the wall as, like a toddler... I took each step one by one. It felt like an eternity before I found myself with no more steps to clamber down. I stood up and began to head towards the lounge. In the bouts of inebriation, my mind would spin the world into things I have never seen the likes of before. The cracks between the large stone tiles on the floor turned into tiny brown snakes that wrapped around my wrists whenever I fell to the floor. They dug in with their fangs and dragged me to the ground, and I had to rip them from my hands and stand up before they could pull me down any further. I attacked them with such vigour that my hands began to bleed. I turned the corner towards the lounge. Lost in the maze of the drug, and unable to distinguish what I was seeing from the real world, I saw something I will never forget. Curtis was laid out on the floor by the sofas, perfectly sliced into segments from head to toe. There was no blood. The top of his head had been cut away, and I remember looking into the cross-section of his brain. His face was portioned into eyes and nose and mouth and chin. He was crying, and he stared at me as he begged for me to help him. I looked further down his body, and found a still-beating heart in one of the slices from his torso. As I looked even closer blood still pumped around his body, as though the spaces between him were not there at all. His hands were separated from his wrists, but they were clenched into tight fists by his side. Help me, he pleaded. Help me. Help me. Help me. He began to shout. 
Help me, he screamed. Help me. Promising him I would do everything I could, I stood up and yelled at one of the cameras that had been constantly watching us. I've seen this footage back, and it chilled me to my core. I spent a couple of moments begging for help at the foot of the sofa. I'm in a ball, in the fetal position, and Curtis is nowhere to be seen. Then I stand up and throw my hands down toward the floor, where I believe Curtis was sliced into partitions. Can't you see this? I call through my tears. You need to help us. He needs help. After my attempts of getting through to the people on the other side of the camera, I stumble outside. Jessie was there again, at the bottom of the pool. Her clothes were ripped and her hair was another beautiful veil above her face. Soon after, in a moment where I simply gave up, I allowed myself to fall into the water. It was Adam that dragged me out and saved my life. It was Annie that looked after us all as we vomited up the contents of our stomachs. It wasn't more than ten minutes before the on-call doctor arrived at the villa, and it was minutes after that that the emergency services arrived. But this isn't a happy ending. When I woke up in this hospital six days ago, I woke up next to Curtis, Lucy and Jules in the hospital beds next to me. Adam and Annie were there too, but they'd been discharged. We were two people short. Oh, Jessie was a truly funny, witty and beautiful character. I'd known her for only a little over a day. Oscar had been stalking her for months. When the police searched his apartment... They found photos, tracking devices, broken bracelets from old festivals, clothing Chessie had worn, and much, much more. When they dug deeper, they'd seen him entering the same clubs as Jessie, watching from the shadows of the dance floor. When they searched her dorm room, they even found his DNA. Quite when he'd begun, the obsession was unclear. But when he'd found out she was going to interview for the show, he decided to make his final move. Mahisma, the company behind Forty Winks, are facing a lawsuit for the way everything was conducted. But it's not believed that much will come from it. They've opened a just giving page for Jesse, and all proceeds will go to a charity that offers protection from stalking. The producers were aware that the pills had been snuck in using the book, and it was intended to be part of the show, one of the many twists. They believed they were merely sleeping pills. As for Oscar Norcott, well, he's facing trial for rape and murder. Well, what did you think of that one? Pretty nasty way to end, really, isn't it? Well, that was a three-part story, and as you can see, I've stuck them all together in one long video for you all. Didn't want to tease you with many different parts over the course of a few days. I thought, oh, I'll just get this one all out of the way in one video. So, my dear, dear friends, you know what? Leave comments below, and I'll do my best to get back to you. Tell me what you thought of this story. Did you like it? Intriguing way to finish it, wasn't it? Okay, well... That's enough for me for one evening, but I will be back again very, very soon with another story for your listening delight. <laughs> okay, guys. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay? <laughs>